to Italy and a court case that for the first time in the world has acknowledged genetics as a factor in criminal behaviour. Deborah Wilson is a legal academic at the University of Canterbury in New Zealand. She's been keeping a keen eye on this landmark Italian case and its possible implications for courts all around the world. Last year, an appeal court in Trieste reduced a nine-year jail sentence for murder down to eight. Why the one-year reduction? Because the judge was satisfied that the man possessed the so-called crime gene. The case basically involved an Algerian native who was living in Italy named Abdul Malik Bayou. He had been convicted of murder of um, a man following a street brawl. And when he came up for, for sentencing, one of the things that was relevant in determining the length of his sentence was the fact that he has what the media is widely reported as being a criminal gene. A criminal gene? What do you mean by that? Well, the argument that his lawyers put forward was that he has this particular gene that makes him more aggressive and impulsive, which basically means that when he committed the murder, he was less in control than someone without this gene. So they argued that he hadn't intended to kill the person, he just reacted. I understand that in a courtroom last year in, in September 2009 in Trieste, Italy, the appeal judge, Pierre Valerio Renotti, said he found evidence, this crime gene evidence, particularly compelling and accepted that it would make Mr Bayou particularly aggressive in stressful situations. So what did he do with that information and, and that conclusion, this judge? He decided that Mr Bayou was less culpable than someone without this crime gene. So the ultimate result was that um, the sentence was actually reduced. Tell me about this gene. It's uh, monoamine oxidase, is that right? Yeah, it's generally just referred to as MAOA. It's a gene that exists on the X chromosome. It basically produces a particular enzyme. And what this enzyme does is it metabolises or destroys uh, serotonin and dopamine levels in the brain. So if you've got a properly functioning MAOA gene, then the uh, levels of serotonin and dopamine in your brain are much reduced. And if you um, have the criminal gene that this man had, you're not producing enough MAOA, which means it's not destroying the serotonin and dopamine, which means that you've got high levels of it in the brain. So the low levels or an absence of MAOA are thought to produce this aggressive criminal conduct. Now this case in Italy, is it a world first? It is. It, well, it's the first time that this kind of argument has ever actually succeeded. Cases have been trying to use this kind of genetic defence since the early 1990s. You know, there's been about 500 cases in, in the States alone over the past five years. But this is the first time that we've actually seen it succeed. Deborah Wilson, the idea of a criminal gene has been around in many shapes and forms for a long time, but in recent years the idea has gained credibility and prominence, and that was after a Dutch study, and I think in the early 1990s. Tell me about that. That's right. Well, this study came about because one of the members of the family approached a geneticist, and she said that there'd been a, a story that the family was in fact cursed. And this curse meant that um, some of the males in the family tended to be more likely to engage in, in sort of criminal conduct. And the woman wanted to know if there was a genetic reason for this predominance of, of violence amongst the family. There was a long history of, of assault, uh, sexual assault, uh, general violence in this family. Yeah, that's right. And so she approached this geneticist, I think it was Mr Han Brunner. She wanted to know if it was simply a, a curse or a family legend or if it actually had um, some kind of basis in genetics. So he went off and did some tests. What did he find? Well, what he found in the study was that in the male members of the family that he tested, they did not have the MAOA gene at all. And so this was used to put forward the argument that if you have low... MAOA or an absence of MAOA, then this is going to predispose you to criminal behaviour. Right. How important was this study? It attracted a lot of attention at the time, didn't it? The most obvious example of, of the attention was that about two years later, this um, gene first appears in, a, in an argument in a criminal case. In the USA? That's right, yes. Let's come back to those cases in the USA in a moment. Since that time... 
MAOA has also been termed not only the crime gene but also the warrior gene because in subsequent studies there has been found to be a lower level of MAOA in some racial and ethnic groups as opposed to others. What sorts of groups have been found to have lower MAOA levels? Well, these are generally the people that have sort of a, a history of warfare. So amongst the Chinese males, for example, um, approximately 77% of Chinese males have the low form of this gene. It's also found in um, Pacific Islanders and also in the Maori population, more than it's found in the Caucasian population. We're entering into some problematic territory here, aren't we? The connection between genes, crime and violence. We are a bit, but the important thing that you can understand when you, when you start to look at the studies is that it's not just the presence of the gene that is likely to make you engage in criminal conduct. It's the presence of the gene coupled with some kind of childhood maltreatment that actually suggests that you're more likely to engage in criminal conduct. Now, when it comes to the Maori population of New Zealand, there have been people who point to the higher-than-average conviction rates for violent crimes in the Maori community and lower levels of MAOA and said, yep, here it is, evidence of a criminal gene. That's been quite a hot potato in New Zealand, hasn't it? It did produce quite a serious public backlash. It's quite dangerous to just um, suggest that because a particular ethnic group has this low form that they are going to be more violent because that's not what the science is saying. What does the science say? Well in 2006 there was a New Zealand study done and basically what they had done was they tracked everyone that was born in a, the city of Dunedin um, over a period of 26 years and they were looking to see whether um, childhood maltreatment led to criminal conduct later on in life. And what they found was when they coupled the childhood maltreatment with a test to see if the people had the low or the normal form of MAOA was that when you combine the low MAOA with childhood maltreatment, the individual would be more likely to commit a crime than someone with the high form of the gene and childhood maltreatment. So did that cut across all ethnic groups? It didn't, and that's another real problem um, that the science is proving to have. Most of the people in the Dunedin study were Caucasian of origin, and subsequent studies that have tried to replicate the results of that study with other ethnic groups haven't generally succeeded. So on the one hand, you've got this study which says low levels of MAOA are in are present in the Maori population, but you've also got this 2006 Dunedin study which suggests that uh, there ain't a strong correlation between race, crime and MAOA levels. That's correct, and that's something that people need to be very much aware of, that we don't know exactly how this gene um, interacts with the various ethnic groups. Now following the Hanbrunner study of the uh, the Dutch crime family in the early 90s, there was a spate of criminal cases in the USA where these arguments were presented to the court as mitigating factors. Tell me about some of those cases. There was one involving uh, Stephen Mobley. Tell me, who was he? Right, well Mobley was the first case to actually try this and he was a man who'd been um, convicted of murder and sentenced to death as a result. He'd actually uh, murdered the manager of a Domino's pizza store during an armed robbery and was sentenced to death, yeah? That's right, it was quite a, a horrific crime. He'd robbed the store and as he was leaving he just turned around and, and shot the manager for no reason. His defence lawyers argued that because of a, a long family history of violence going back generations that there should be a DNA test to establish if he does or doesn't have low MAOA. The lawyers looked at the Brunner study and they wondered if the low MAOA was something that their client had. They didn't really have a lot of other mitigating factors. Um, Stephen Mobley was the son of a multimillionaire. He'd been brought up relatively privileged. So the lawyers were kind of trying any argument that they could but they were aware of a family history of violence and they just wondered whether this was genetic in origin. Were they able to present that evidence to the criminal court? No, they weren't. They had to apply for funding from the court to get the genetic tests done and the judge said at the time that the science was not advanced enough. But subsequently many other criminal defendants or 
people found guilty of, of, of crimes have uh, tried to bring this argument into the courtroom. Uh, there was a, a Jeffrey Landrigan who, who uh, I think committed murder following an escape from prison and was sentenced to death. Who was he and was he successful? 